read to you this morning from the book of Ephesians, <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read a couple of verses there to introduce the lesson we're going to study very briefly this morning. <coughs> we have a large number of folks who are not with us today. Some, of course, are ailing and unable to be here. We have a usual number of folks who are gone to speak at other places, and as well, we have some who are out of town visiting family members and friends, and we want to remember them all and pray for them all that they'll have recoveries and safe travels home for those who are away. In Ephesians 4 and verse 26, the Bible says this, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Paul here makes it abundantly clear that it is not sinful per, for a person to be mad or to become angry. However, he does point out that those feelings of anger are to be dealt with quickly. Paul says, even before the sun goes down, if you will. If not, he points out an inevitable fact, and that is that we make an opportunity for the devil, an opportunity for him to tempt us to do things, to say things, or to act in a way that's not right. Lipscomb referred to this verse and said, Refuse to follow the evil passions and they will subside. If we dally with sin, if we trifle with right, if we indulge and cherish passions that lead to sin, we shall be overtaken in crime and must become the helpless slaves of the devil. Lipscomb seemed to understand something just as Paul was pointing out here. Whenever we allow anger to reside in our hearts, it winds up being acted out in our life one way or another and it leads to sin. David, Paul rather says, we make room or we give place to the devil. Very briefly this morning, I want to talk to you about this idea in some ways that we make room for Satan in our life. Before we study, though, we need to pray. We'll ask you to please humble while we do. First of all, I think we should understand that when we fail to watch for the advances of Satan, when we fail to be attentive to the fact that Satan is at work, we make an opportunity for him. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The apostle Peter here makes it abundantly clear that the devil is not at rest. It's not that the devil sits back and waits for an opportunity, much as, uh, much as people often do, look for or wait for an opportunity to come to them to do something or to be involved in something, but he is active as a hungry or roaring lion, as one seeking his prey. He's looking for someone to devour. And therefore, we need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful. We need to be attentive to the fact that the devil is indeed looking for an opportunity to try us and to take us if possible. We need to understand then that we need to be aware of the devil's attacks on the church. When there's trouble in the church today, man needs to understand that it's because of Satan. And I'm, I'm afraid sometimes we lose sight of that fact. Sometimes I hear people excuse unrest or confusion in the church by saying, well, it's the lot of mankind. You know, you're going to have problems and misunderstandings and confusion between men because that's the way men are. Some people tell me, well, no, really the problem is it's just some poor misguided soul. Someone got some bad advice somewhere and they really want to do what's right, but they're just not doing the right thing. But on the other hand, I hear some people say, well, no, he's just a troublemaker. That's the way they've always been. They ain't never done nothing but stir up trouble in the church. And that's all they're ever going to do. And that's all they're ever going to be. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's Satan who's behind it. It's the devil today who causes church trouble. It's the devil today who's trying to take the church, trying to destroy the church. And the way he does that is by leading Christians from God, by tempting Christians to sin. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias was to fire his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Notice this morning, Peter says the root of the problem was that Ananias was a poor misguided soul. No, the root of the problem was that Sapphira was an evil and a wicked woman. 
No. The root of the problem is they were human beings and that's simply the way human beings are. No. Peter says the root of the problem is the devil. Ananias and, Ananias and Sapphira were a fault, of course. Their lack of vigilance had caused a problem here. Peter says that Peter, if Peter had not dealt with it swiftly, others may have think it profitable or allowable to lie to the Holy Spirit. But notice, if you will, very quickly, Peter deals with the problem, and the fact of the matter is, there was a punishment, if you will, for Ananias and Sapphira for yielding to the work of Satan, the temptation of Satan, rather than being vigilant. And so today I say this. We need to be aware of what goes on in our congregations and be vigilant of the fact that it's the devil who's at work. It's Satan today who is bent on destroying the kingdom. It's Satan today who is set on destroying the church. And the way he does that, of course, is by destroying individuals. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, then, the Bible says, We beseech you, brethren, know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Sometimes the reason churches are so troubled and the reason church trouble goes to the lengths and the extent that it does is because people don't want to know one another. They don't understand one another. And that's really here what Paul's talking about. They were to know, they were to be familiar with those who labored among them and worked with them in preaching to them and in preaching to the community the gospel of Christ. They were to be familiar with one another. I hear of situations, just as I'm sure you do too, when problems pop up in a congregation or something happens and people are shocked and mortified and then I hear those words that make me worry and wonder when somebody says, I just had no idea. I, I never would have thought that they would have done something like that or said something like that or been involved in that. I had no idea that they would believe that or that they would teach that. And I began to wonder, why? Why don't you know? How couldn't you know? Why couldn't you see it? Why weren't you able to see it? And the leading reason is because they're not familiar with them. They see them once or twice a week at church, tops, maybe not that many times. Maybe they just see them once a week at church. And then when something crops up and something bad happens, they're shocked and mortified. Do you know what Paul says? Paul says we're to be so close-knit that we know one another. We're familiar with one another. We know who our teachers are, who our leaders are, and our leaders know who we are. We need to be, we need to know those who work with us and labor with us in the gospel of Christ. If they hold strange doctrines or practices, we need to understand it. In Matthew chapter 7 then, and verse 15, the Bible says, Beware false prophets which come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Notice here Jesus points out that a person will be able to understand who they are, what they are, and what they do by the works they produce. Notice he says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Pay a little attention to them. Listen to the things they say. Watch the things they do. Look at the things that they're involved in. That'll tell you who they are. It'll tell you what they believe in. It'll tell you what they stand for. Jesus here, particularly in reference, is speaking to those who are false teachers or false prophets. Those who bring trouble to the cause of Christ. Those who cause division and strife in the kingdom. Jesus said can be identified by the things they do. Therefore, I say today, we need to be aware of what's going on in the church. We need to be aware of what's going on in our congregation and who our brethren are, who, what they stand for, and what they believe in. Secondly, I'd have you note this too. We need to be aware of the devil's attacks on our homes. Some today excuse the misconduct of children as childhood rebellions. They tell me that's what we all go through, you know. As we grow up, we're learning, and we're going to sow our wild oats. Others lament the ruin of homes as a sad series of unfortunate events. I just wish things hadn't happened that way. The cards were stacked against them, I hear people say. Everything that they did, every decision that they made just happened to be the wrong one. Well, listen, folks, the problem is the devil. He's working against your home. He doesn't want your children to grow up and become Christians. He doesn't want you to be a good leader in the church. He doesn't want you to be a faithful member of the church. And so what he's going to do is to attack you and your home. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontentency. You notice what Paul talks about here? When he speaks of that intimate relationship between a husband and a wife, you notice what he says? Satan can and does even use that as an opportunity to tempt you. He uses even that relationship as an opportunity to drive a wedge between you and your wife, between you and your husband. He uses that in contingency as an opportunity to tempt you to sin, to tempt you to err, to tempt you to do things that are contrary to God's word and will. And so here's what I know. I need to be aware of what Satan's doing to my home. I need to pay attention to what the devil's doing in my home. We need to be aware of our mates today. We need to be aware of how they stand and what they are. Are they strong? Are they weak? Do they prize spiritual things? Or do they prize only physical things? Are they drifting from the church or from the Lord? Are they drifting from us? Are we drifting apart? Is there a problem? We need to be aware today of our husbands and wives and how they fare spiritually and how they stand spiritually. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Our home today, of course, is heaven. And a husband and a wife today should be married to people whose goal and whose aim is to make it to heaven and to help each other make it to heaven. And I think that's here what Peter is pointing out. That a husband, of course, then should honor his wife as a child of God, as a Christian, as an heir of the grace of life. And so today we need to be aware of who our mates are. There's a sister down in South Alabama, um, I know William and Denise know Sister Grimes, Chapman Grimes there at uh, Lowry was a leader in the church for years and years. A few years after Brother Chapman passed away, I was passing through there and uh, nothing doing but to go to Sister Grimes' house and have lunch on that Sunday. And so we did and we visited. And as we were sitting there visiting, she got to talking about Chapman and how much she missed him and how much she loved him and got to talking about the things that made him important to her. The first thing she said was, we used to study together. Now that's always amazing. She did not talk about the good living Chapman had made through the years. She didn't talk about how funny Chapman might have been. She didn't talk about how good or how sweet or how important he was to her because of some little things he may have done about the house. The first thing that was important to her was she was somebody that he was somebody that she could study the Bible. She he was somebody that she could discuss the Bible with. Sister Grimes has been one of those women through the years who always stood out in my mind as an example of a Christian woman and somebody who was dedicated to the church and the truth. And a large part of that was because she was married some, to somebody who was dedicated as well. And they could help each other and they could work together and they could strengthen one another as Christians. And so let me ask you today, where does your husband and wife stand today? When you evaluate your family, when you look at your mate today, how do you value them? What's the first thing that pops up in your mind in a list of why they're so important and so good for you and good to you? But secondly today, I say this as well, we need to be aware of our children. How do they do spiritually? How are they faring, faring spiritually? Do they have the proper influence in their life? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they drifting? You know, we have a number of, uh, and I, I wrestle with how to, how to describe this. I don't know if I say us young parents or if I just say a parent with young children. I fall in this bucket somewhere, you know. But there is a danger I think we face and we need to be aware of, especially in raising young children. Young children, I say. Well, there is a danger that we need to face up to, and that we need to realize. Our children today, they need to be protected. I don't know if it's always been this way. I didn't recognize it so much when my older children were young, but you know in the perverse society we're living in, our children really need to be protected. 
Now more than ever, I think we need to look out for them and be aware of the influences around them and the influences on them. I think today children are faced with adult situations today. Well, I know in, in my life, they are faced with adult situations today at a younger age than I faced them. And I think even at a younger age than my older children faced them. And so I think today as parents of especially young children, we need to be aware and we need to be careful and we need to protect our children from what's out there. We need to make sure that they have the proper influence around them. I used to hear brethren say, and I questioned it whenever my older children were young, you know, there would be something that they wouldn't let their children be involved in. Uh, like this time of year, especially what falls in my mind is the holidays, the celebrating the holidays. And uh, they would say, well, you know, my children, they don't get to celebrate these holidays, or we don't celebrate these holidays, so I'm going to let them do so-and-so. Something else equally is questionable. Uh, I'm going to let them go to a movie, or I'm going to let them go be involved in some other program. And really it was a, a trade-off of two things that neither one of them were good for the child. Neither one of them were good for a Christian to begin with, but they had this feeling that since their children were not able to be involved in this sin, since their children were not able to be involved in this perversion, since their children were not able to be involved in this thing, that at best was questionable and most likely wrong, they felt bad because they deprived their children of that sinful experience. And so what they said was, I'm going to let them be involved in this other sinful experience. Don't fall in that trap. Don't fall in that trap. And don't feel bad about withholding sinful things from your children. Don't feel bad about keeping your children from doing things that are questionable, that are wrong. And don't make bargains with the devil. I'm going to tell you right now, brother, if you'll regret. The fact of the matter is our children, of course, need to be raised with the proper influence. They need to be taught what is right because it is right. We need to be thankful to encourage them to do what's right. The Bible does describe pride as a sin and an error, so I won't say be proud, but we need to be bold enough and strong enough to simply say we're going to do what's right because it's the right thing. Now, if everybody else in the world is doing it and my child is the only one who's not doing it, big deal. They're doing the right thing. Y'all ain't. Don't fall in the trap of bargaining with the children's souls. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of my father, and forsake not the law of my mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. Let us find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them, and refrain thy foot from their path. Again, in Proverbs 24 and verse 1, he says, Be not thou envious against evil men, need a desire to be with them. We today need to make sure that our children have a good and proper influence about them. They need to be encircled, if you will, by friends, by family, who are as devoted to the truth as you are, and who will encourage them as you do. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, then he said, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. But I tell you this morning, my friends, when we fail to be vigilant, when we fail to be watchful, when we fail to watch for the devil's attack on the church and the devil's attack on our home, we make an opportunity for him. And he, he makes us sorry every time. Secondly, I hope you note this too. When we fail to preach and to practice sound doctrine, we make room for the devil. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 12, the Bible says, but what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, 
whose end shall be according to their works. We need to understand today that Satan is going to preach false doctrine whether we preach sound doctrine or not. His ministers or his agents, if you will, are going to preach those things that are contrary to God's word whether you preach God's word or not. The simple fact of the matter is would we fail to preach and practice sound doctrine, the only thing that is heard and seen is false doctrine. So today, when I fail to preach and live the truth, I make an opportunity for the devil. In Titus 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The word sound here literally means to be uh, uncorrupt, if you were will. Uncorrupted in any form. Today, no one can be faulted for teaching or for doing what is unquestionably right. And that's what we need. We need today sound doctrine, that which is sound, uncorrupt, and therefore do what is sound and uncorrupted. In Titus 1 and verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Notice, if you will, he points out that the elders were to use sound doctrine to refute and to correct those who oppose the truth. Now, understand this, friends. It is only sound doctrine that convinces men of the error of their way, and it is only sound doctrine that can undo, destroy, False doctrine. Only sound doctrine. I hear people who've made bargains with folks. There's been trouble and unrest in congregations. And men have talked to people who were preaching and teaching things that were wrong. And they pled with them. And they bargained with them. And they begged them. And they asked them not to teach those things. And they threatened them saying, if you continue to teach this, we're not going to let you teach anymore. And finally, the false teacher uh, not wanting to give up his pulpit, finally said, well, you know, I just won't, I won't preach it anymore. I won't, I won't teach this subject anymore. Just give him the old scout's honor and said, I, I just won't do that anymore. And so they quit. And then three or four or five months later, come to find out they're teaching it again, not only in the pulpit, now quietly in somebody's home. Why is that? Only sound doctrine can undo false doctrine. You can't bargain a false teacher into repentance. You can't bargain a false practice out of existence. The only way it is undone is by sound doctrine. So here's what I know. By preaching, by teaching, by living the truth, we're able to combat, to undo, and to destroy the false teaching that surrounds us today. In the absence of sound doctrine, there is going to be an abundance of false doctrine. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. So today, my friends, here's what I know. When you and I fail to preach the sound doctrine of the New Testament, we make an opportunity for Satan to preach false doctrine. We need today doctrinal preaching on worship, church government, Christian living, baptism, what it is and what it means, church identity, faith, contribution. We need sound doctrinal teaching on the great doctrines taught in the New Testament. What that does is protects us from the influence of false doctrine. But finally this morning, I'd have you understand this too. We need to understand that when we try to fight a spiritual battle with a carnal weapon, we make room for Satan. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21 says this. From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. 
Peter today could not bear the idea in this reading of Jesus dying. And so his idea was to protect him. His idea was to prevent his death. And in doing this, he was actually fighting a spiritual battle with a carnal weapon. Jesus said that this was the devil's way. This was the devil's mean. This was the devil's idea. And in that, he was making room for the devil in his heart and in his life to seek to undo the plan of God. The Bible teaches us that we fight today not with carnal weapons, but with spiritual. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice how Paul describes his weapons that we fight with. We fight with things that cast down imaginations. We fight with things that, that cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we fight with things that bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What's he talking about? He's talking about the spiritual weapon, the sword of the spirit, the word of God that we use today. That's the battle we fight. That's the sword we fight with. That's the weapon we use in this war that we're involved in. But today, my friends, we sin. We're in error when we try to use a physical, if you will, weapon to fight a spiritual battle. Now let me illustrate that. There are some today who believe that there are practices that the church should employ that are not authorized by the scriptures. We ought to have them. We can have them, and we should have them today. They tell me, now listen, we want our children to learn the truth. We want our children to uh, understand God and to know who God is. And so the best thing and the best way to do that is for us to buy this property next to us here and to fix in a building, joining this building with classrooms in it where we can teach our children. We can segregate them by age and by marital status when they get older and we can send them all out there in their various classrooms and they can all learn the truth. Bella told me uh, this week I talked to a brother who got a call from a lady in uh, Montana who had kind of found out about us through the uh, internet and she would called him and was talking to him about these one cup brethren and what they believe and how they worshipped. She said our church here where I worship has six people. Six people. He said ask her about communion. Well we have individual cups. He said well, what about Sunday school or Bible classes? She said, well, yes, we have Bible classes. Now, I don't know how you have Bible classes with six people, but there are some people who are so married to the idea that we've got to have this to fight this battle that they go to ridiculous lengths to hold on to it. Well, there's a very basic problem with this. The Bible teaches us in the book of 1 Corinthians that when the church is gathered together in one place, that's where the church is to be taught, in one undivided assembly. The problem with Bible classes and with Sunday school classes is that they are not a method of teaching. Some of them argue, I've heard people argue that that's just one way of teaching people. You can do it in one assembly or in divided assemblies. You can do it in various means, but that's a different way of teaching. Well, it's not. Sunday school classes or Bible classes are a method of assembly. Now, if you don't believe that, Go to a place, talk them into it. When everybody divides up into the various classes and everybody sits down and everybody gets ready, no teacher stands up to teach. Everybody sits there quietly. Everybody sits there waiting to be taught. Why? It's because Sunday school is a method of assembling. It is not a method of teaching. A method of teaching is preaching like this or questions and answers as they do in some congregations, or writing a lesson up here on the board for everybody to read or projecting it on the screen. Those are all methods of teaching where knowledge is transferred. But dividing people up into various little classrooms is not a method of teaching. It's a method of assembly. And it violates the divine example given to us in the book of 1 Corinthians. Of course, we know about individual cups. And people tell us today that the best way, the easiest way, the safest way for us to commune is to for all of us to partake of it out of our own individual communion cups. Pass 
this around with a little tray. And everybody has their own cup in there. And then we can all partake of that. And we don't have to worry about getting whatever sickness is we're afraid of at the time. A few years ago, it was the bird flu. Now they're trying to stir up hepatitis, you know, the forgotten disease, hepatitis C. Now, it seems like every time I turn on the radio or turn on the television, there's a commercial about the forgotten disease, hepatitis C. You'd think it was hanging on every doorknob and every uh, vehicle and every restaurant you went into. This disease is just lurking there and it's waiting to get all over you. So that's why you need to use individual cups, cups because you don't want to spread that stuff to everybody around you. Well, of course, that violates the divine example that Jesus gave when he took this loaf and gave thanks for it and break it and gave it to his disciples and told them to do likewise. When he took this cup and partook of it and gave it to the disciples and told them to drink all of it and they all drank from it, Mark tells us. You know what happens? We're trying to fight a spiritual battle with a carnal weapon. And, of course, the devil makes us sorry every time. Orphan homes today, people tell me so much about. They tell me how important it is and how great it is and what a great work it is and how that we all need to make donations to these various groups that have these orphanages. And what we need to do is sit down as the leadership of the church and what we need to do is all of us decide how much this congregation can send and then send it to an orphan's home where they can take care of those little orphans out there and they can take care of those children who don't have anybody else to take care of them and they can provide for them. The problem is that's an unscriptural use of the treasury. We're not authorized to do that any place or anywhere. You know, one of the things I've often wondered, I've mentioned this to several people who bring up these orphan's homes, if you're so worried about them, then uh, why don't you get involved in a program here at home? If you're up so upset about them, why don't you get involved in a foster care program? Why don't you get involved in a mentoring program? Maybe brother, big brothers or big sisters or something like that. If you're so worried about these children who don't have the proper influence around them, then why don't you get involved personally and make a difference in their lives? I don't find any takers. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like that sermon I read a few years ago where they were talking about evangelism, and the title of the sermon was, Here's my check, send him. And that's the way a lot of these things are, orphans, homes, and other things. The idea is something needs to be done, but I'm not going to do it. I don't mind violating the scriptures, but I'm not going to put my hands in there. You know what we've done? We've tried to fight spiritual battles with carnal weapons. You know what happened to us? Division. Bible classes divided us. Individual cups divided us. Orphans' homes divided us. Missionary societies divided us. All the innovations that have come in the last 200 years have done little more than cause division in the body of Christ. Why is that? It's because when we try to fight spiritual battles with a carnal weapon, we make room for Satan. Proverbs 16 and verse 25 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so here's my conclusion, brethren. We need today to be vigilant. We need today to be watchful. We need to understand that Satan, this very hour, seeks an opportunity to destroy us. And when we fail to be vigilant, when we fail to preach the truth, when we fail to fight <coughs> spiritual battles with the sword of the Spirit, we make room for Satan. And he he makes us sorry every time. I have a thing with you this morning. You're not a Christian? Why not become one today? Believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. And this morning, be baptized for the remission of your sins. We make you come. I will stand inside. <coughs>